Amen. Why was it good? Because it was the word of God. Hallelujah. And we talked about Naomi, uh, a sweet woman, a pleasant woman who who decided because of some some really difficult times in her life, she changed her name and her identity to Mara. We talked about bitterness being the seed and that is the fruit of unforgiveness. And so we we, we talked about that, how we ought to be forgiving. And we believe that if we're not forgiving others, that that is indeed affecting our identity in the things of God. Why? Because we're falling into this to this pit called bitterness and bitter people can't see what's going on. They can't see the blessings of God. They can't see the people, the roofs in our lives that are around us to, to help nourish us and help to, 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 to see, you know, what God is, is up to in our lives. And so today, if last week was, was forgiven, this week we're going to talk about from the subject of being chosen. Amen? Chosen. From, from I can remember, y'all, I can remember when I was in elementary school, I mean vividly, I remember being in elementary school. And I remember uh, in elementary school uh, in the 90s, um, we had in a murals at the beginning of school if you came a little early. Did anybody have that where you came a little early to school? Maybe your school wasn't as awesome as mine. No, but <laughs> that was a joke. Come on. Um, and so we would get there a little early and we play ball and stuff. But if, as soon as we get there, everybody would pick teams. They would pick teams. And, and, and so there would be captains sometimes. Amen. I would be a captain. But there were times when I wasn't a captain, and I remember getting into sixth grade. I was I was going to a new school in sixth grade, and they have these intramurals in, in the beginning. And there was an eighth grader. He was like, you know, the big the big guy, and they're picking teams. And I remember they were picking teams, and I practiced a lot. And I was pretty good, y'all. And and they're just and they're just picking teams. And I got him. I got him. I got him. I got I got her. What did you? You picked the girl over me, praise the and, and I said, Amen. That's when I knew the women, the WNBA was was on the rise and 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 God was doing something in them. And they would pick him. And I will never forget that day where I was not chosen. I didn't get picked. And for some reason, at the age of 37, I can still remember that. I can still remember, and I'm sure I think we all kind of can can agree to this. You can remember the times in your life. Where you weren't picked, where you weren't chosen, when you felt like you were better than those who you think were chosen before you and you saw were chosen before you and, and you, 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 you had this feeling, you know, we all have this feeling and this desire to be wanted and to be chosen. Now, some would, would argue about that, you know, uh, me and my wife laugh about it. You know, we always say, what is it better to be needed or to be wanted? To be needed or to be wanted, right? And mothers know and they love their babies, their, their little babies, and, and they feed them and they take care of them. And they love that because, because there's something in us that loves to be needed, right, moms, right? You, you like to be needed. You know, that baby can't do anything without you. But there's something even more beautiful in being wanted. And I believe today that the Lord is just, is just reminding us through his word today, that listen, I know that I, I, I do need you. You're my hands, my feet, you're my arms. You are indeed the body of Christ. But I want you to never forget that you're not just needed, but you're wanted. That God has a choice and he has chosen you. He's chosen you. Paul gets a hold of this and he writes a letter to the church in Ephesus. This church that was very, uh, 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 in the nation that they were in, they were very prosperous and in that city. And he had planted a church there. And he's writing them uh, in prison and he's reminding them of who they are in Christ. Last week we came from the book of Ephesians as well because in Ephesians he writes to this church in Ephesus and he's just reminding them over and over again of their identity in Christ. And this was so important because in that city, uh, you had a lot of wealth. You've had a lot of prestige. Uh, uh, there were, there were, there were, um, um, uh, soldiers there and, and, and athletes there and, and warriors in that city. And so everybody found their own identity in what they did. 
They found their identity. Sounds like America, right? Sounds like they found their identity in their jobs. You know, whether they were a, a warrior in that time or an athlete today, whether, whether or not if they, if they owned something or even if they were in the temple, their identity was based on the position that they had in the temple. And he says, listen, y'all, I just want to let you know something that your identity is not tied to what you do, but it's tied to who you know. And he reminds them right here in Ephesians, if you can go with me, Ephesians chapter number one, he says, Paul, chapter number one, verse number one, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace. This is what we say at the end of every service. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Come on, amen to that, somebody. He says that he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, but verse number four is where we're going to get to. He says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, somebody say holy, and without blame, and without blame, <laughs> before him in love. He says, just as you are chosen by God, chosen by God before the foundations of the world, that you would be holy and blameless in love, in him. You have been chosen, chosen. I will, I will begin by saying this as well that our, our identity, it always seems to be in this place of restarting, of resetting. Think about this, that, that when, when you were a kid, you, you, tried to, you had to develop your identity as a child, right? So you, you try to figure out, you know, um, um, what's, what's good and what's bad. You know, as a kid, you start to grow up a little bit. You got a nickname. You know, maybe you were good at video games or good at a, at a game that you played outside. And you were trying to find your identity as a kid. But then as, as, a, as a child, then you started to grow up. And then you stepped into your teen years. And, and then you, your identity, you know, your focus begin to change and then then it was more about what do I look like right what do I look like how am I dressing you know who accepts me who's who's my friend and who isn't my friend did I reach my growth spurt am I in the in crowd you know uh, and and then you then you have another restart when you go to college right and and the first part of that college usually if you grew up in church the first question is am I still going to church <laughs> Because I don't have to go to church no more. You know, now I can, I can get a break from this thing. So, so now you're starting to, 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 to restart again your identity. And now you're, you're you know, trying to, trying to bring in your, your identity with the Lord, with your personal identity and, and your own brand now that everybody has to, has to create. And, and it's always going in this restarting, right? And then you graduate to an adult. And you think you got it. Only to find out you're restarting again and, Finding out who you are. Okay, where am I going to work? Okay, I really want this job. And then you pray, yeah, then I get the job. No, I don't really want this job. And, and then, I, well, I went to school and then, and then now I got to pay all these student loans. And, and all of these things pulling at our identity. Come on. And then for some of us in the room, we, 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 some of us got married. And now we're trying to find our identity in marriage. You know, or you may be single and now you're trying to find your identity and thinking that I was supposed to be somewhere now at this age and I'm not there and I'm trying to be good with where I'm at. Do you see the challenges and the reason why Paul is writing this and why God is imploring us to deal with this, with this thing called identity? Because our lives are full of identity restarts. And just as we think we have it together and who we are, something else enters into the equation to make us question again who we are and whose we are. Again, who we are and whose we are. That the very moment we think we've got it, that, okay, Lord, I've laid aside that thing. I'm continuing to gaze on you and I'm going to follow and trust your leadership. Then something else jumps in to pull away at your identity in Christ. 
But hallelujah, today we're going to be aware, right? We're going to grow from this. Hallelujah. Hear me, hear me. If we're, if we're not careful in this thing and get a hold of our identity in the Lord, then we'll tend to follow and fall into the choices that others have made that have now shaped our identity. The choices of others that have now shaped our identity. But we're saying today, right? We're saying today, God, we want to hear your voice because we believe that you are the one that gave us the identity first. We said last week, and I just want you to just, just follow me with this, because in Genesis 1, we see the first time that God speaks life to his sons and daughters and gives them their identity. We talked about it last week. I hope you remember uh, one, one of the first things he does is, is that he makes us in his likeness, right? That we are like him, that we don't have to be like Mike, but we can focus on being like him. Right. That was Michael Jordan, whatever. But you don't but you can be like him. You don't have to try to be like whoever you've you've patterned your life after. But we're saying, God, we, you you gave us your likeness. You we are fearfully and wonderfully made in the likeness and image of the most high God. Amen. The most powerful, the all knowing. Then the Bible says that he blessed us, that we would be fruitful and multiply. That we would be fruitful and multiply. That there would be some fruit bearing out of our lives. Fruit out of our good decisions. And there also, because the law is put in place, there will be some fruit from our negative decisions that we have to deal with. Right? Amen. Come on. That's the law. Sowing and reaping. And so he says, I made you in my likeness. I'm giving you some identity. You you will be fruitful and multiply. That, excuse me, that you would have dominion. That there will be a sense of dominion, right? That, 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 you, that you won't always be the borrowers, but, but you will be the lenders. Come on. Hallelujah. That we will not always be borrowers, but we will be lenders. Somebody say amen to that. That's not a financial thing. That's a, that's a spiritual thing. Glory to God. For the, for the borrower is, is, is a slave to the lender. We don't want to owe nobody but to love them. Glory to God. This is why we don't want to be in debt. Hallelujah. And this is why we are, we consider everything that we do. We just went off on a little tangent, but we'll come right back. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Somebody say chosen. He's chosen us and that's our identity. But here's here's the first trick that we see in the Bible. We see that Eve in Genesis chapter number three, verse five. I don't know if you ever saw this, but this this really blessed me as I was preparing. The Bible says in Genesis chapter three, verse five, as the serpent went to went to go and 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 deceive Adam and Eve. And you do know that the deception was was not about the stuff. It was about identity, right? It was about identity. Okay, we'll prove it, Pastor. Well, I, thank you. I will do that. The Bible says in verse number five, for God knows, the serpent says, that in the day you eat of this tree, uh, that your eyes will be opened and that you will be like, 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 you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Isn't that amazing that the first thing the enemy went after and, and he knew that if I can trip you up in this area, I can get you to disobey God and mess up everything. He said, if I can get them to understand and start to see, even though God made them like him, I just need to, to, to just throw a little small little fox, a little wrench in there and say, you know what? If you eat of this, you'll really be like God. <laughs> the thing is, Eve, you were made already like him. Why would you fall for the deception to be more like him? And I said, whoa, whoa, that sounds like it sounds like me right there that I'm always tempted and with when it comes to my identity to to fall into the things of this world to make me more like a God. Oh, I'm sorry. Here's how you how you can understand it to put me more in control. That if you would do this, see, you ain't got to keep going to church and doing all the spiritual stuff. All you need to do is get this, and then you're going to be in control, and then you can make the decisions, a.k.a. then you'll truly be a God. Then you'll truly be in control, right? And that sounds like Genesis 3, 5 right there. Because God knows that if I can just get you to not see yourself as God sees you, then then if I can get you to, to, to start questioning there, I can get you to question every area of your life. 
If I can get you to believe that all you got to do, not saying that you shouldn't do it, all you got to do is just make money. All you got to do is have the right degree and all you got to do is meet the right person. All you got to do is just do this. All you got to do. All, I'm telling you, you ain't got to do nothing else. And, and I'm not saying that some of those things are, are bad things, but that's not all you need to do. First, you need to make sure that God, all I first need is you. Because you are the one that identifies who I am. And I'm chosen. Not just chosen, but I'm wanted. I'm wanted. I'm, I'm not just needed, but I'm, I'm wanted. That, that means that he has a desire for me. It's not that he needs me. You know, I, there are some people in my life that I may need, but I don't care much about. Okay, I'm sorry. Did, did that sound mean? I'm sorry. That it, okay, I wasn't meaning it like that. What I'm saying is, is that I need the person. Uh, well, I guess in New Jersey, I guess I need them. But, but I was going to say, to, to, you, you need people to do certain things. You need somebody to, to help you. No, you don't need nobody nowadays. You got, I was going to say at the grocery store to ring out, but now you can ring out yourself. Praise the Lord. But you, you may need somebody to do something in your life. I didn't prepare that part of the message. Pump gas, right? In New Jersey, right? In South, you don't need. But if you, you may need someone to do something in your life to help you, but that doesn't mean you desire to be in deep relationship with them. It's those people who you want in your life, who you pull close to you, that you have a desire for. And God is saying, I have chosen you. I want you. I want to use you. The first trick was to make you and I believe that we were not who God has already identified us to be. That's the first lie. See, the lies of Satan are simply to repackage the good gifts that God has already given us. So God has given us love. The enemy wants to give us lust. God has given us joy. Enemy, the enemy wants to give us happiness. Right? God wants to give us peace. The enemy wants to give us pleasure. Always trying to deceive and to try to speak new words in our identity in the Lord. To try to pull us away. And we know that God is saying, listen, I chose you. I want you. I want to use you. I'm laying hold of you. I'm already, I'm knocking at the door. I'm trying to get in. And we're coming today to say, God, we receive. Because listen to this. This what I'm talking about today, being identified by the Lord and stepping into your God-given identity in the Father is not something that can be achieved. It can only be received. It cannot be achieved, but it can only be received by faith today. Hallelujah. Here, here's what I want you to understand. There are two reasons why the Lord, I mean, there's more reasons, but I only got a few minutes. There's two reasons why the Lord has chosen you today. Amen. The reason, two reasons why he says here in verse number four, and we can find the first one. He says, I, I chose you before the foundations of the world that you would be holy and blameless to be holy and to be blameless. To be holy is to be set apart. Right. It's, it's to have this exclusive, intimate relationship with the father. It's to have this exclusive relationship. It's uh, it, I don't know if many, many of us remember this as often as we should. In First Thessalonians, the, the writer there reminds us that the will of God is that we would be what? Somebody say holy. holy. That that is the will of God. I know we're out here trying to find God. What is my will? What is the will? Do I go here? Do I go there? But first off, the, the will of God is that we would be holy. And holiness is not a certain outfit, but it's a certain devotion. It's not a certain outfit, but it's a certain devotion. Because if you can, get, you can get the outfit right and look the part of holiness, but that doesn't mean you have the devotion. But I guarantee you this, if you get the devotion, then, then it will come out in your appearance. But the question is, are you willing to be holy? Are you willing to be set apart, to be completely devoted? Are you willing to have this full-time devotion to the Holy One? And this is why we're here. This, is, this speaks to the vision, to the core of who we are as Revival City. This speaks to the core of who we are 
Because Jesus calls and gives this example and this imagery of these, of these ten virgins and five being foolish and five being wise. And the Bible declares that those who are wise, they did not just have their lamps lit, but they also had some oil on the side to make sure that their lamps can continue to burn bright. And so it is, we believe that God has chosen us, Revival City. We believe that God has chosen each and every one of us. He ain't just say he needed us, but he wants us because we've decided, thank you, Lord, we've decided not to just get our lamps on fire, but to have some oil when that fire starts to burn out. Somebody say amen to this. There are so many who have the fire for a season and may have the fire for a couple of months. But if you do not have the devotion and the intimacy with God, that is the oil that you will need when you don't feel what you need to feel in the presence of God. Amen. Because you, you, you've been there where you where you just felt like, you know, you're, you just step in the season, just feel so far away from God. Right. And that's OK. Your feelings, whatever. Right. We don't we don't care. You know, we don't. We don't, we don't lean on the feelings. Our feelings, sometimes you feel like it, sometimes you don't. We know our feelings move around, glory to God. And that's why we have to find that firm foundation, which is Jesus, glory to God. We got to find that firm foundation and, and say, God, I'm, I'm completely devoted to you and I'm choosing holiness today. Why? Because you want me. And holiness allows me to continue to have the relationship that is required with you. And so I'm praying today that we would say yes to holiness, that we would not just say yes to an attire. And yes, come on, we ain't going to be out here trying to trip each other up with attire. Glory to God. But we're saying, God, we want to be devoted. We want to be found faithful. We want to be found faithful. We want to be uh, uh, the, the wise steward, Lord God. We, when you call us back together again and you ask us, what did we do with our talents? We want you to say, well done, that we have been faithful over the few. Somebody clap your hands. Glory to God. That we have been faithful over the few. Think about your life. Come on. That you have to be faithful over the small things. Success in life is nothing but being faithful in the small decisions that you have to make every day. So many of us are trying to make the good big decisions. And yes, you need to make good big decisions, but you have more smaller decisions that you need to make. And every time we're being faithful to God in the small decisions, we're saying yes to being devoted to God and saying yes to holiness and saying, God, my life is separated unto you, Father. So that you will teach us how to engage this world that we're living in. The Bible says that he chose you to be holy today. To be devoted to the things of God. To have that devotion. Hallelujah. He says to be holy and to be blameless. Blameless before him in love. Blameless before him in love. Love. That's the only way you can be blameless in love. <laughs> he says, I want you to be set apart, devoted, and I want you to be blameless. That means no condemnation. None. I chose you to be holy and to not allow yourself to get caught up in condemnation. Do you know, I heard, I heard it said a long time ago that the largest nation of believers is condemnation. That, that most believers, we find ourselves not coming boldly like we talked about earlier today. We were talking about come boldly, come boldly. And, and for some of you, if you're honest, raise your heart, not your hand. But if you're honest, how difficult was that? That wasn't always, you know, how about this? Let's raise our hand up in here. Sometimes it's difficult to come boldly to the throne of God. Okay, you're the only one, Pastor. Glory to God. Amen. Pastor needs healing up in here. Glory to God. But sometimes it's difficult to come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain the mercy and help in the time of need. It's not always easy because, because the enemy, the accuser of the brethren, has a full-time occupation in condemnation and trying to condemn us. And trying to remind us why we're not worthy of what God has already poured out on us. That we're not worthy of the identity that God has already given us. And he says, I want you to know that I chose you. 
I picked you on my team and I don't need you to be playing scared. I don't need you when you check into the game. Come on, just stay with me with this story right here. I don't need you when you get into the game, you're playing scared. Don't listen to the crowd. Don't listen to the noise. But I chose you. I want you on my team because I believe in you. I put something in you. And I don't want you to be playing and walking around in this life blame, full of blame and condemnation. Come on, somebody. He says, but I, I want you to be set apart. Thank you, Dane. I want you to be set apart. And, and I want you to be blameless in my love. Because I love you. And you have been chosen. Not because I need you, because I want you. Blameless. One of the things that gems us up when it comes to our identity in Christ is when we decide the brother of Jesus, half brother of Jesus, his name is James, he writes, he writes a letter and it becomes the book of James. And he says, he says, if anyone, in James chapter 1, he says, if anyone is a hearer of the word and does not do, he is like a man observing himself in a natural mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in whatever he does. So then my question is, how do I get blessed in whatever I do? Let's just go backwards then. How do you get blessed in whatever you do? If you want to write this down, how do you get blessed in every area of your life? What is a blessing? A blessing is empowered to prosper. Hallelujah. Don't, we, don't, we don't walk away from the blessing. Right. So he says, how do you do that? Let's go backwards. He says, um, he says, uh, don't be a hearer of the word of God, but be a doer. Come on. He says, because if you hear and don't do, it's as if you are looking in a mirror. Let's say this is a mirror. You're looking in a mirror. Then you walk away and immediately forget what you look like. Identity. He says, but if you continue to look in the perfect law of liberty, the word of God, the word of God, he says, the word of God is our mirror. What God has spoken is our mirror. And he says, if you can continue to look into the perfect law of liberality, perfect law of freedom, Jesus he says, if you can continue to look into the perfect law of liberty, glory to God, then he says, then you just won't be a hearer of the word, but you'll be a doer of the word. And I promise you, that's when you'll be blessed and prosper in everything that you do. Glory to God. Somebody say amen to this. He says that the blessing comes out of you knowing who you are and always remembering what you look like and what God has spoken over you. That's where the blessing comes. The blessing comes, and, and I know this is my iPad, but this is the word of the Lord. I got my Bible in here. This is where I do all my deal, spiritually, glory to God. So this is my Bible. And the moment I get out of the word and forget, is that, that's when the problems begin. That's when the problems, that's when I, when I forget that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, hallelujah, and, and that God predestined me and got purpose and plan. The moment I leave that and forget that, <laughs> that's when I don't know where to go. And always bad things happen to me. And, and I don't know where I want to go. And, and if everyone, you know, and, then, and Jordan has said to me, and he didn't even say hi to me when he saw me. And I don't know. I don't know. I don't have any friends. I don't have any friends. <laughs> Come on. Laugh. It's all good. Hallelujah. I'm talking about your neighbor. I'm not talking about you. Glory to God. But, but, but you notice that the moment you step out of the mirror and you don't be a doer, the key is, is that when you, when you put the word in your heart, not put it down, but when it's in your heart, that's when you're saying, God, I'm out here to do. Because when I begin to do, I start begin, I start beginning to look more like you. The more I begin to do the word, that's when I begin to look like you. And that's when I begin to remember the perfect law of liberty. The perfect law of freedom. He says, listen, I, I'm the one that gave you that identity. The enemy's always been trying to deceive us from the very beginning. 
But if you can just keep your eyes in the mirror and keep studying and remembering who you are, that we will not allow the scripture to get tattooed on our arms and not tattooed on our hearts. Glory to God that we will not allow the scripture just to just go here and never go here. Glory to God that that we won't allow scriptures that we've remembered, memorized to to now become like just things that we know, you know, it's just Lord of my shepherd. Yeah. And, and that's not even real to you anymore because you know it so much and you sang it so much in different songs. It's just like it ain't even real to you anymore. But we're saying, God, we're, we're not going to let go. We're going to continue to keep our eyes on you and the perfect law of liberty. And not just be hearers of your word, but be doers of your word. Why? Because you have chosen us. And you don't need us, but you want us. You've chosen us, God, to be holy and to be blameless. And lastly, lastly, the second one here, the reason why God has chosen us. He says, John, John writes this in chapter number 15, verse 16. Let's go there real quick. John chapter 15 Verse 16. Are you getting something today? Are you blessed? You're receiving something? Come on. Uh, John chapter 15, verse 16. It's, he says this, and he gets real bold. Jesus writes here, and he says, You did not choose me, but I chose you. Let's get this clear. And I appointed you and anointed you. I'm just going to add that anointed there. I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. That your fruit, not, not that you're going to bear fruit, just bear fruit, but that your fruit would remain. That's key. That your fruit would remain. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, it will be given unto you. He says, I just want to remind you, that before you chose me, before you started coming to church, and your parents or your guardian or somebody forced you to come, before you chose me, I chose you. But I didn't just choose you just to be with me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would bear fruit in your life. And not just bear any kind of fruit, but fruit that would remain. There's a purpose for what he said right there. Glory to God. God has a track record of always choosing potential over current status. God has a, has a track record of choosing and wanting men and women, you know this, we can go through the whole Bible, of choosing men and women that have great potential, but in their current state is not, is not what God would really need them to be. I mean, just think about it. I mean, Abraham was an idol worshiper. I mean, I mean, you know, uh, uh, Moses, he had identity issues out the kazoo. I mean, you know, he was in the water and then he's grown up in Pharaoh's house. I mean, he's got some real... He, you know, by his step parents, you know, um, and, and he's got identity issues that we all have. Right. Um, whether you grew up in home, out of home, we all got them. Uh, uh, Jacob was a, was a liar and a deceiver. Right. God had to change his name too. hallelujah. Peter um, was was a businessman. Uh, and not I don't know how great his business was doing at the time, but um, but he also was shaky in his commitment. He uh, he was the type of guy that said, you know, I ain't going to leave you, man. I'm your guy. I'm your best friend. I'll fight for you, man. I cut somebody's ear off for you. But when it got real deal, no, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't really, I don't really mess with that guy. Obviously, then he would come back, glory to God, but God still used him. God, of course, used Paul, which was one of the world's greatest terrorists in the Middle East in that time. You know, God still used him, but God chose them based off of their potential. But he chose them to do something. Here it is before we go. He chose them that they would bear fruit. That they would bear fruit, spiritual fruit in their lives. I do want to remind, I've, I've, the Lord reminded me of this, of this scripture in 2 Peter, chapter number one. And I used to confess this over my life every day. I need to get back to doing it, amen. There's so many good scriptures, y'all. Uh, Peter writes, he says, uh, 2 Peter, chapter number one, grace and peace be multiplied unto you in the knowledge of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, as his divine power has given to us all things, divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through knowledge of him uh, who is called by, by his glorious grace and virtue by which we have been given to us. Watch this. Exceeding great and precious promises. Somebody repeat after me. Exceeding great 
and precious promises. He says that God has given us exceeding great precious promises that through these promises, we may be partakers of the divine nature. Somebody say divine nature. That's right. You're going to repeat this whole message in just a minute. He says that, that through these promises, that you would be a partaker of the divine nature of God, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through their lust. He says that if you operate through my great and precious promises, that if you live according to what I promise, then you will now begin to produce through this divine nature. Okay, let me help you. He says, if you live your life according to my promises, you'll start to see miracles being produced in your life. The divine nature of God start to work on your behalf. Glory to God. He says that if you start living in my promises and being in faith in what I'm speaking, what I have spoken to you in my word and am speaking to you, uh, hallelujah, by my spirit on the day to day basis. He says you will begin to see this divine nature start taking place. And you'll start seeing the divine relationships and, and the divine favor of God start being orchestrated in your life. I'm the only one excited about that. Glory to God. And I believe this divine nature is going to be the thing that gets you to bear the fruit that God has, has prepared for you. Because not only, church, are we going to bear fruit, but our fruit is going to remain. It ain't going to be temporal. It's going to remain. That's why we don't just we don't just sow for now, but we have this eternity on the inside of us. And that's why when I had to learn as a young man, you know, my dad said, when you help people, you listen, if they ask to borrow money, that means they don't have the money. So why do you expect them to pay you back? Now, I'm not saying that you don't pay back your debts. Glory to God. But <laughs> you better pay that mortgage, right? You better pay your debt now. Glory to God. You, you asked for it. But, but, but when it came to me being generous to certain people in my life, and, and, and of course, as a pastor, you know, you, you love the sheep. And so you got you to gotta bless them and take care of them and all that good stuff. And so he said, listen, I learned a long time ago, if, if they didn't have it and they asked me for it, then I released that debt. I, I, you, don't, you don't owe me anymore. Why? Because there's a, there's a divine nature working on the inside. And I found that every time I sow, God is going to get it back to me. Every time I sow, the divine nature of God is going to start going into effect and it's going to come back. And when your pastor was was 23 years old, I think I was 20, 22 or 23 years old. I'll never forget when I was when I was able to um, you can come on up when I was able to to uh, it was it was like 2006. Right. It was 2006. And and uh, I was I was about 22, 23 years old and. And that year, I said, this is going to be a banner year. I'm going to give the most I've ever given before in my life. I've told this testimony before, but I want to, I feel like I need to tell it again. And, and that year, I was able to give $10,000. And mind you, I'm living at home and, and I'm working a little bit and, and I'm saving up money, saving up money. And I, um, and it was, it was all this money. I was strong and heavy into trading at the time and stocks and things of that nature. And so I had got about $10,000 in this, in this account. Um, it was like 11000 thousand man and and I remember it was one service and I felt led and and I just got my checks against that account and glory to God I wrote the check and boom we gonna sow the whole seat and I remember my, my the guy who was watching my account he called me what happened so much your, your account just got empty what happened you know uh and I was just like yeah it's, it's okay um and, and now mind you he doesn't really go to church so he's so I'm just like yeah I was I just felt I'm thinking to myself, he is not going to understand what I'm going to say right now. <laughs> but I just felt, you know, just just led right there to do that. And he was like, oh, OK, George. All right. I'll, I'll give you a call back. I'll give you a call back and let you let, let you think about what you did. And then I also remember that year. <laughs> I also remember that year um, I was I was at the church and I was hanging out with somebody and they said, yeah, there's a there's a there's a mission. Um, they sell cars. And I said, oh, my God. 
I'm about to give a car. I'm about to sell it. I'm about to sell a car into somebody's life. And, and so he said, yeah, you could go there and you can get a car. So I went there and I was like, y'all got cars for cheap? Because <laughs> I just gave away all my money. So I don't have a lot of money, but I do want to sell a car. And, and he was just like, yeah, this car is a little under a thousand bucks. I was like, oh my God, does it work? You know? And so he was like, yeah, it works. And I got in it. I drove it a little bit. So I was like, yo, the car works. I'm about to sell a car. So I never forget, um, I called my dad and I was like, dad, in that year, um, dad, late, after that, we had the church, we had given away six cars, six people in the church. After we gave away this car um, the, to a young lady who needed a car, we was like, you know, we just prayed over her and blessed her with a vehicle. Now you can go forth, you know, and then we started just giving cars away. And then, yes, people started calling, hey, the church is giving cars away. No, it's a spiritual thing. <laughs> People were like, I want to come get a car. But we were, we started showing these vehicles and I'll never forget. And me and my wife till this very single day, we always feel that we got car favor. We just got car favor, man. We've sown, in, we've sown in that area and we just feel like we got car favor. You know, we help, we help a couple of people with their, with their rent and their mortgage. We feel like we got house favor, glory to God. Cause we've sown seed in these areas and we know that our fruit will remain, that the seed will bring forth in its likeness. And so, and so when I had to forgive someone who I felt offended me, and they did not, they did not make a mistakenly offended me, they did it on purpose. Somebody say on purpose. No, you offended me on purpose. You planned it. You knew all about it. But when I decided to forgive them, that was now me planting that seed that I believe is going to bring harvest in my life and begin to flow the divine nature of God to get that divine nature flowing. Some of us right now, we got to get that, that, that divine nature again flowing in our lives by saying, God, I'm going to move by what you're saying, by what you're speaking over my life. Why? Because you have chosen me. You have appointed me, Lord God. You have set me apart to be holy. You told me to come to you boldly and not be, be full of blame, Lord God. And you anointed me, Father, so, so that I would bear fruit in my life and not just doing it, just bearing all types of fruit, but that my fruit would remain. That I'm going to look up years from now and I'm still going to be feeding off of seeds that I've sown 20, 30 years ago. I still feel like I'm eating off of some 2006 seed, y'all. I'm telling you. And then, and then certain areas in my life that I feel like I'm not eating off of, I'm, I'm, I got to sow a seed in that area. I got to trust God in that area. I got to sow a seed of faith. I got to forget. God, what is it that you want me to do? Because I'm according to your promise. I'm living according to your promises and I want the divine nature of God to be flowing in my life. He doesn't need us, but he wants us. And he wants us so that he can bless us. He wants us so that we can bear fruit that doesn't, doesn't wash away. And he says, yeah, George, you can go ahead and do this and do that, but I want to let you know I got something greater. I know you got the whole career thing going. But if it doesn't remain, if it can't stand through the fire. And what do you mean by that, Pastor? Are you saying I should leave my job tomorrow? No, I'm just saying turn your job into something eternal. What I'm saying is, is get an eternal purpose connected to that thing. Wherever you are, just start going in there tomorrow and saying, God, what do you want to do with this? What do you want to do with this career? What do you want to do with this thing I've started? Because I want my fruit to remain. I want it to last. I want it to be a good man leaves an inheritance. God, I want to leave an inheritance, not just for my natural children, for, but for those who are connected to me in my life and those who are coming behind us, Revival City. We want to blaze the trail of faithfulness to the Lord. Let's just close our eyes for a minute. Let's just close our eyes for a minute. All right, now let's take a Selah moment. Let's just, let's just stop and let's just think. <sighs> Let the word of God fall on good ground today. Because our identity is not, it's not achieved, it's received. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. 
We receive it today, God. Can we just take a moment and get back in the mirror? I want us to just take a moment and get back into the mirror. To just, to just say, God, I, I got to get back into your word. I got to get back in what you have spoken over me. You just want to get back into the mirror. While your head's about, eyes closed, or wherever you are, if you can be free if you want to get up and move around a little bit. But I do have a testimony. My wife told me, she said, she said, honey, when you, when you said a couple weeks ago to just take a moment and, and write down what you're hearing from the Lord, she said, that was a couple weeks ago, and I looked back over it, and I just started to see how God was doing that word. And at the time, I just thought, okay, Lord, thank you. I, I believe it's you. But now it's like, I'm starting, no, that was the Lord speaking to me. And so it is, I pray that you would get back in the mirror and start writing and journaling again. Yes, God. You can unmute the microphones, hallelujah. Yes, God. We're going to step back into some worship. Glory to Jesus. Right where you are. Come on, let's all stand together. Because the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, he said that, listen, Paul writes, he says, <laughs> he says, I'm least in all the saints, but a grace was given that God chose me God chose me to, to go and preach the, the manifold wisdom of God. To make known the, to the rulers and the authorities the purpose, the eternal purpose of what God is up to in us and through us. And so today I just want us to say yes. To say yes to God's choice in choosing you. To say yes, God, I say yes to, to what you, the identity that you have given me today. To say, God, it's not something that I can achieve, but it's something, Lord God, that I receive today. Yes, God. Just take a few seconds before we go.